be with you. And also with you. And a good morning to each and all who are gathered here today in the sanctuary. I see everyone is in their customary pew, <laughs> except Mike True. You're kind of a... You, I you know. was complaining. Carlo got me going on a weed whacker, and I spent hours <laughs> swearing and throwing it around. He got it going, so I have to complain to him. Uh, <laughs> so you spent a few hours swearing and working. Huh? Do you remember the, the, the movie Home Alone? Yes. When Mike, when not Michael, um, Kevin. Kevin goes Kevin. to church and he tells the man he's feeling bad about himself. And the man says, well, church is the place to be when you're feeling bad about yourself. So Mike, this is the place for you. To be. <laughs> After all of that program. Well, welcome to Greendale People's Church once again. We're in the chapel today. We will be in the chapel until the elevator gets there, yes? Update. Tuesday, they're coming to fix it. Hopefully, it'll be done by Tuesday. Good. If not, we'll be here until it gets fixed. Okay. Good. You have heard the word. Very good. Those who are viewing at home, we welcome you to this service today. As well. We are able to do this for people who cannot come to church uh, out of the generosity and, and devotion of Lynn. Al comes with her. Kim as well. Kim's been sick lately, so that's left Lynn kind of soloing for this time. Uh, it's a reminder that we're always in need of people to volunteer to learn how to do this so that we can provide this service, service in more ways than one, to people who can't come to church. So, um, see Lynn if you have any questions about some of the demands of taking on that task. But she's learned it, and she's like riding a bike, you never forget how, and she's doing it for us each week. But please consider that. And if you're at home and will at some point be able to come back and consider offering your services for this because you know yourself how important this is. We're in the month of June. We are what we call an open and affirming church, meaning we affirm people of any gender, any sexual orientation, because this is a place where people are welcome. For goodness sakes, if if, uh, if if I'm accepted, then everyone is accepted. <laughs> so thanks be to God. This is a place where we come together uh, without looking down our noses at each other so that we can grow closer together and walk with Jesus Christ through life by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a good way to go. So welcome to all, each and all, this day. Let's now prepare our hearts for worship prelude.
far as the windows go, if it gets warm in here, whoever is seated near the aisle, you're welcome to open up the windows to get some fresh air in. And if once you do, a dog starts barking, you're free to close it. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, you've gathered us once again by your grace. You have called us each by name to be in relationship with you. And now you've brought us to this place to be in relationship with each other and with you. So speak to each of us in a way we need to hear from you most. Stir our hearts to reach out beyond the walls that we sometimes put up around ourselves to be welcoming and accepting and loving to the people around us, even as you have been to us. Use these acts of worship that we go through today, the singing, the sermon, and the sacrament, that we would experience this day in a special and new way, your grace, which is alive, and brings us back to life. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing, number 593. scripture reading comes from the book of 1 Samuel in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. The books of Samuel in the Old Testament really have a lot to do about hearing, about listening to God, about listening to a word other than everyday chatter that we all get involved in. A word that breaks from the great beyond into this world and into people's lives. Some have said the book of Samuel is a long story that illustrates what the, they call in the Jewish tradition the Shema, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, your strength, your might, and so on. Hear, O Israel. You must listen. Because we all know the voices in our own heads can go in circles. But when a voice comes from beyond, and it is the Lord's, all things are set straight. The word of the Lord was rare in Israel in the time when Samuel came to the temple. And we hear that the Lord is now breaking into history, into Samuel's life, and into Israel through this young chap, Samuel. Gail has this reading for us today. Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you have called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and he lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, Lord, for, I'm sorry, here I am, for you have called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, for you have called me. Then Eli perceived the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your, spirit, your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we will begin this time of prayer with a period of silence so that your still small voice might speak to each of us as we listen. We so often think of prayer as one directional, us to you. But there are times when we pause in the busyness of life and at moments like this to just in the quiet listen. And we pray that you would bring into our minds what you would say to each of us personally during this time of silence. Thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned us. It is us who go astray and wander far from you, but you are close. 
I pray that someone has heard you today in a special way that they have not heard you before. We give you thanks for this morning, for the gift of life that we each have to come to this place today, the gift of health, relative in some cases, strong in others. I pray that uh, in our weakness you will be all the more strong if in this day we find ourselves struggling. We know that uh, there are people throughout the world whose ears are closed to you, whose minds are shut, and your word cannot penetrate them. We pray that you would soften hearts and open ears and minds people would hear a word of your grace and your love, a word that you speak to each person, claiming them as your own, and offering them a purposeful and meaningful life as you and they live together. Each of us carries with us concerns about people. We know their troubles and their challenges. We wish we could do something to relieve them of their stress and strain and difficulty and agony. But we are limited, so we go to you. And there are also people we are rejoicing over. The valley that they have been going through has come to an end. They are now on solid ground. We want to mention them before you as well, too, for rejoicing with gratitude in your goodness. Whatever these people are going through, we bring them now before you, each by name. Warren. Jim. Chelsea. Jim. Lord, send your spirit among us to bring our voices together as one. As we pray, as Jesus taught us, saying, Amen. Richly, and now we return to you a portion of what we have received. We also desire that the ministry of this church continue, that this would be a place where people can come and find you. So give us the wisdom to use these gifts wisely so that that may occur. And we avail ourselves to your will and your purposes through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
I'll be in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians, I think pretty much through June. 2 Corinthians is a defense of Paul's ministry. He and the people in Corinth are not seeing eye to eye. He was a little strict and demanding of them in 1 Corinthians. And some noses got out of joint in Corinth. And they decided that there were better apostles than Paul because they had higher credentials, loftier. They were more glamorous than Paul. And so Paul writes 2 Corinthians to restore the relationship, but also to explain who he is, who Jesus Christ is with him, and what his life is all about. For Paul, you've maybe ever heard this before, God didn't ask him to be successful. God asked him to be faithful. And Paul will keep the faith to the very end through even the most trying and difficult times and even when people are not loving him and adoring him. We're in the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. Hear the word of the Lord. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Light will shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars. Now, that's a way of explaining the human body. Human comes from humus, the Greek word. Humus is clay. In other words, we are clay, and in us is a great treasure. We have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For we who are living are always being handed over to death. Twice he says, always, always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our mortal flesh. So, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Six times in that passage, Paul mentions the love of his life, Jesus, six times. For Paul, he doesn't have the same perspective we have. We think if someone is successful, they have lots of money, they have lots of fame, and they have lots of glamour and applause. And Paul had none of those. He was not a success by worldly standards, but he was faithful. Faithful to the love of his life, Jesus Christ. The one he met on the way to Damascus, when he was trying to climb the ladder in the Jewish tradition. He was what they call a Pharisee, one of the leaders. And he figured if he could persecute this new band of people called Christians, he would show himself to be worthy. And so he was going to go to Damascus and round up some of these Christians and put them down fast. And while he was on the way to Damascus, on one of those dusty Roman roads, in the broad daylight, the sun was shining down, and suddenly he was struck. He fell to the ground and he heard these words. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, Saul at the time, was stunned. And he 
And he said, well, who are you, Lord? And the reply was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go to Damascus and find a man who will restore your eyesight that you have now lost, and you will receive instructions about what your life will be. And when he received the instructions, he was told, you will suffer a great deal. But your task is to be faithful in all of that difficulty. For it is in your faithfulness, even in difficulty, that you will be a testament to the world around you. Amen. You are a clay pot, but there is a treasure inside of you. And the interesting thing is when the clay pot gets broken, you see what's inside. And what is inside is the eternal life of Jesus Christ. You may get broken, but life will live on. So do not lose, faith, lose the faith. Do not lose heart. Keep the faith. And you will know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Keep the faith, folks. That's the gist of this sermon today. When Paul was in his final days, he was faithful. But he was also in prison. Because the Romans didn't like the way he was changing the world with his proclamation that Jesus, not Caesar, was Lord. And people were following him, and they didn't like it. Everyone was to bow a knee to Caesar, the emperor of Rome. And Paul said, I bow to the Lord of all and of a kingdom that is not of this world. And he kept the faith. There he was in prison. And among his last words were this, when he had basically been abandoned by everyone, appearing to be an utter failure. He said, the good fight I have fought. The course set out for me, I have finished. The faith I have kept. That is success, keeping the faith to the bitter end. And you know the power the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the life that cannot be taken. The goal, keep the faith. Don't shrink back. Don't turn back. Keep pressing on. Keep the faith. Amen. I ran into a quote this week from Albert Einstein, who needs no introduction. He said this, if you want happiness, attach yourself to a goal, not to people or things. Paul attached himself to a goal. You could say, well, he attached himself to Jesus, yeah, but his goal was this, to remain constantly faithful to Jesus and to his task. He's had a goal, and to that he was faithful, and in that way he was a success. You got to refigure what success means. Success means keeping the faith, staying faithful. On Friday, I celebrated an anniversary with my beloved wife. All right, I'll tell you 44 years. Well, she's something to look at, but I'm not. <laughs> But one thing is for sure, by the grace of God, we have kept the faith. Amen. And that is success. Do we have a palace we live in? No. Am I world famous? Uh-uh. But we have the faith, the faithfulness to each other. That, my friends, is success. And that's what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. To remain true to the bitter end. And Paul persevered during the trouble, and God stayed faithful and gave him the strength he needed to keep the faith. I don't know that we can keep the faith on our own. We need God to give us the power. Amen. Isn't that what they say in the 12 steps? Your life was unmanageable, and there's no way you're going to get yourself out. You have to turn it over to a higher power, and it is that higher power that will get you out. And it is that that keeps a person faithful and on the right track, 
day by day, one day at a time. And that's what success is. And Paul remains faithful throughout the fight, he says, when he was in that prison at the end. The Greek word for fight or struggle is agonia. We get our word agony. Anybody ever here, here ever experience a little bit of agony? <laughs> a struggle? The desire maybe to give up? Turn back? In the struggles is what often when people turn away and lose the faith and, and do not keep it any longer. And what Paul is talking about in our passage today is how in the midst of all of that agony, the struggle of life, even though he was knocked down, he was not knocked out because God lifted him up, because God raises the dead. He said, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in the body the death of Jesus so that the death, the life of Jesus, may be also visible in our mortal bodies. Agony, the struggle, will try to make you quit. But the good fight, the good agony, is turning over your life day by day to a power greater than yourself, and that is the risen Christ at work in you. Amen. by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a great goal to set for yourself, to remain faithful, to trust and in the agony, in the fight, it's a good fight. Because the good fight is an opportunity to turn your life over repeatedly to the power of God. Jesus kept the faith. To the bitter end, he kept the faith. He ran his course a course that nobody else could run, and he had the agony, make no mistake about it. He was put under temptation to try to abandon his task, his course, what God had set out for him. He was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He was tempted there in the garden when he prayed, Lord, get me out of this. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. And it was agony that he suffered. And on the cross as well, the agony of the pain and of the mocking and of the desertion. But he kept the faith to the bitter end. And he is for us the model and example of faithfulness. But it's not up to us to keep that. He comes in us and with us to make sure that we can keep the faith as well. We are not left alone. Amen. Under intense feelings of anguish and agony, he kept the faith. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Feeling forsaken even by God. Wow, how utter agony that is. But he kept the faith. Everyone had deserted him. Some denied him. Some betrayed him. The rest abandoned him, but he kept the faith. And he went through death and was raised. His goal was to remain faithful. And in his last breath, he said, it is finished. It is accomplished. I have kept the faith. Paul carries this Jesus who was faithful to the end in himself because Jesus passed through that death into life and isn't sitting in some remote place, but is in and among us to keep us faithful to the end. Paul says, I carry this treasure in a jar of clay. You've seen clay pots. They're not much to look at. One of the things they used to do in the Roman Empire is they would hide their treasure in something that nobody would suspect has anything of value in it. Because clay pots don't have much value. What a great place to hide it. If you hid it in a safe with jewels on the safe, people would say, aha, there's something of great value in that. But when they see a clay pot, they wouldn't think that there's something of value. But Paul is saying, God, in God's mercy and in God's power and in God's grace, chooses the inconspicuous and the not so glamorous to reside in 
And Paul says he chose me, a clay pot. Clay pots are fragile, they break. But the interesting thing is, when a clay pot breaks, you see what's inside. And when Paul breaks, when all of these things are happening, he was stoned, he was beaten, he was tossed out of town, he was whipped repeatedly, he was breaking, but he kept the faith. And the life of Christ was evident in him. You can break the pot, but when you do, you see what's inside. And what is inside is the power of Jesus Christ alive, never to have life taken from him again. And that life is in us. Amen. And we live on. During World War II, there was a Lutheran bishop named Hans Lilia. Hans Lilia did not cooperate with the Nazi authorities. They wanted the people, the pastors in the church, to preach sort of the... Third Reich, the Nazi gospel, which was no gospel at all, and he refused. And he suffered because of it. After his imprisonment, and when World War II ended, he wrote a book called The Valley of the Shadow of Death, about his experiences in the concentration camps, and what life was like for him there, the agony, the struggle he underwent. He was first in Dachau concentration camp and later was transferred to Buchenwald where Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed as well, another faithful pastor during those times. He was held in solitary confinement and when he would be taken out he was tortured because they were trying to extract out of him a confession that he had not been faithful to Hitler. And he had been faithful to someone other than that, and they would not stand for it. They wanted him to reveal the name of other people and pastors who were not going along with Hitler, and they would torture him. And he was remarkably calm during most of the interrogations. I mean, enormous agony and struggle he underwent, but he would remain calm. At one point, one of the Gestapo chiefs was getting a little bit frustrated with him because he would not break. And the Gestapo chief said to him, all of your Jesus Christ stuff, look where it has gotten you. Don't you know that I could kill you right now? Bishop Lilia looked up at him calmly and said, I died already. My life is not accounted to me as of any worth. The only value of my life is that the life of Jesus Christ will be evident in me. So do with me as you wish. But you do not have the last word. Jesus Christ does. Amen. Look where it has gotten me. It has gotten me on the doorway into heaven. For if you kill me, there is life beyond. So death to me holds no sway. I have died already. Bishop Lilia's favorite verse came from Paul, from Romans chapter 14. Whether we live unto the Lord or die unto the Lord, we are the Lord's. For to that end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. You cannot separate a person from Jesus Christ. The love of God in Jesus Christ, Paul says, I died already, but I will live no matter what you do. No matter what agony I go through, life will be revealed because life has the last word, because life comes from God. What kind of agonies are you going through? I'm sure you're suffering some, or you know somebody who is. Jesus is in with you and in you to carry you through during those agonies to give you the strength to keep the faith. Paul also says, the course that I have finished was a course set out only for me. Each person in some way is given a course to run by God. You're all dealt the hand of cards, you might say, and it's up to you to play the cards you've been dealt. Paul knew that. Jesus had his own course that he had to go. And each of us do as well. 
And one of the things that we make a mistake in doing and living in, in this life is we start to think that somebody else has a better deck of cards than we have. And we start to compare ourselves with others. They have more. They have it easier. Or they may have it harder or whatever. That is their course. And their task is to remain and keep the faith in whatever course they have. The course that each of us has is to remain faithful and keep the faith to the end. Somebody once said, do not compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to who you used to be rather than what other people are. Yeah. And imagine yourself in comparison to who you once were. And what can you say about yourself now? Grow out of whoever you were into something greater. And the way you can do that is because Christ is in you, working in you to will and to purpose. Good things for you. Don't compare yourself to others. Compare yourself to who you used to be. You know, I sometimes say, I'm not what I ought to be, I'm not what I'm going to be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. <laughs> That's the course that's set out for us to grow. Not to be successful, but to be faithful. Because keeping the faith, my friends, is winning. No matter the agony of, or the length of the course, yeah. keep the faith. Yeah. Have you kept the faith? It's easy to waver. It's easy to falter. It is in keeping the faith that we acquire the prize. What is your goal? Is it attached to things or people? Or is it to simply keep the faith? Paul said to the Philippians when he was in a different jail because he was stirring up the crowds and turning them away from the way the status quo was. He said, one thing I do Forgetting what lies behind, I press on to what is ahead, which is the goal of the upward call of Christ Jesus. I press on. I don't look back. That's the goal, to remain faithful. Even when he's afflicted, even when he's perplexed, even when he's persecuted, even when he's knocked down and the pot breaks, what is seen? The treasure inside, Amen. Jesus Christ. That's success, and that's keeping the faith. Well, um, I end now with a revision that I did to this sermon this morning. <laughs> when I got up to read the sports news. <laughs> there is a school in the NCAA, the college playoffs for small schools. A school called Birmingham Southern University. Birmingham Southern. They were out of the Methodist tradition of private school, small school, but they remain alive in the playoffs, even though this past week they closed the school. They closed the school for financial reasons. So here is a team representing a school that's dead. But they're alive, and they go on. And they persist. A team that's dead but alive Wow, that is the Christian message. Alive through all of this. A team without a school. With a name on their jersey of a dead institution. Dead, yet the team is alive. Yeah, that's the Christian message. All is lost, but they live on. Yeah. That's the message of the Christian faith. Yesterday, they were down as the game was coming to an end. Their fans remained loyal and cheered for them, even when it looked like they were on the precipice of being defeated, and the tournament was ended, and they were dead like their school was. They'd fallen behind, and in the eighth inning, one of their batters hit a home run. ESPN says this, Connecting on a hanging curveball, the player sent his home run over the left field wall to set off a wild celebration on the field and in the stands of Classic Park. And as this batter rounded third and was greeted at the plate by his delirious teammates, and here's what caught my eye, 
a rowdy group, college kids, rowdy? <laughs> a rowdy group from Sigma Chi fraternity brothers from the school who had kept the faith. When things looked bleak, were dancing in the aisles. Keeping the faith when things look bleak, because the power and the life of Jesus Christ is in us and lives on, even in the agony, even when we break, the treasure is seen. Jesus was raised to life, and nobody can take it from him now. And that life is now in us. They concluded in the article, it was a, another memorable moment in a season full of memorable moments for Birmingham Southern University. And I can't help but mention that the initials of their school is BSU. <laughs> a team bonded by adversity, but they live on. And that is no BSU. <laughs> a team dead and a team alive. Don't attach yourself to all of those things. Attach yourself to life. Make that your goal and to keep the faith accordingly. I think the story captures what it means to keep the faith. The players and the fans. Jesus kept the faith and is now with us in our agony. An agony he's well acquainted with. On our course, whatever yours may be, so that we might keep the faith and claim the prize. And when we finally break, as we all do, that's when our clay pots are broke open and what is revealed is the life of Christ in us, which will never be taken from us throughout all eternity. Keep the faith, my friends. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We desire to give God our thanks and praise. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord, come among us today by the Holy Spirit. Come and speak wordlessly through the elements today to claim us as yours and to convey your love and your grace for us. For it was you who let your body be broken in death so we might have forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. Use these sacraments today, Lord, to bring life into us. Some need that grace, for the agony is sometimes overbearing, and the course gets left behind, or we stray from our course. Bring us back, Lord. Use this to convey your goodness to us so that we might keep the faith. Unite us with each other and with all your people around you in heaven and those on earth. Consecrate us body and soul that we will be a living acceptable offering to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray now and forever. Amen. Amen. The, the bread which we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. And the cup which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? We have gifts from God for us, the people of God. Come today and receive them with grateful hearts. We'll call the deacons up at this time.
supper shared in the spirit with your son Jesus, who makes us new, who gives us life eternal. We thank you for giving us all good gifts in him, and pledge ourselves to serve you even as in Christ you have served us. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Sunday in June, we have our birthdays for this month. Anyone here? Yes, Deb. The 6th? 26th, okay. Nancy? Pointing you out. The 12th? 14th. 14th. 16th. And 16th here. Very good. Yes. Mr. Copeland. Today. Today. Yeah. Uh, some people that usually are here but aren't today is Dennis Co uh, Christo is um, a tomorrow, actually, the third. And Kim is the tenth. June Ayers is the seventeenth. And Steve. Give Steve our best. Steve Hackett, that's the 23rd, and that's it. We have several others, but they, yeah, oh, Claude, yes, yours is 22. 22nd, very good. Any anniversaries? Yes. The 29th. The Samanos are the 29th. The Wilders? 16th. The 16th. Yes. Hackett. Hackett's are the 14th. Congratulations. Very good. Okay, so on our first slide we have about our mission support, anyone who would like to support the church in any way and any of our missions, you can do that by scanning the QR code that's posted or going through PayPal or dropping off an envelope here at 25 Francis Street here in Worcester 01606. I hope you all like the entryway floor. We got it finished this week, so that looks very good. And the elevator, I think you may have heard, is going to be fixed this week, hopefully Tuesday, and then our rotation um, will continue where the next service will be upstairs. If that changes, uh, we will post it on Facebook, and I'll try to have it on a message on the, the phone so you can get uh, keep up to date. The food pantry. Today is mac and cheese that we're collecting, and next week is canned vegetables. Um, the Theology 2 course is ongoing. It's meeting for the next four weeks at 10 a.m. on Wednesday in the conference room. If you would like to join us, you please come. If you want to catch up on the first three classes, those all have been taped, and you can get those uh, through the website. Greendale People's Church website. Or you can, it is live streamed on the day. The Hunger Appeal funds, um, that's one of the missions here at the church. It really funds four areas. The Thursday Cafe where we make sandwiches for the Fellowship Church, Mustard Seed, the Food Pantry, and Breakfast Program. The chart that you see is giving what it costs approximately, months it goes up and down, but for approximately what it is per month to financially fund these, either with money or by people's donations of food, actual food items. Um, if you have any questions about that, please come and see me and I'm happy to discuss that with you. And we're also welcoming any donations you'd like to make. The breakfast program will be meeting after this service to pack the bags and distribute them so that people can take them out to the city so that they, we feed people that don't have any other source of um, getting food. And if you have any questions about that, Lynn Wazalewski would be happy to help you with that. The flower dedication today is in memory of Stephen Klein on the sixth anniversary of his passing by his wife, Sherry. Amen. 
Coffee hosts are Dennis and Michelle O'Malley. And anybody, we have a, after Father's Day, actually starting Father's Day, we have a very open list. So if you are interested in helping, please sign up. If you have any questions about it, I'm happy to answer those for you as well. The second craft day. This is where some people get together with their, uh, that like to make different things. And they're going to be held on June 8th at 10 o'clock, 10 to noon, in the conference room. And for any questions, please see Deb Hackett, Janet Anderson, or Nancy Samata. Okay. We only had, last week I announced about the Polar Park. Uh, they invited GPC to be part of their family fest. And we've only had three people sign up. So if I don't get anything else, we're not going as a group. You can go individually. That's their welcome you individually. The cost is $14 per adult and $10 for any child 2 to 18. And don't tell an 18 year old they're a child. Shh. <laughs> 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 on that one. Carlo, the garden, do you have something that you want? I just want to thank all my gardeners that showed up Friday. We had like 12 people and I didn't have to do it. <laughs> also, um, Arthur Clemens' service is, do you have a date or not? Well, I don't know that it's been made public yet, but uh, tentatively June 15, which is a Saturday at 11 o'clock here, with collation to follow. Does that sound right, Deb? Has any of that, you heard any of this yet? I haven't heard yet. But okay. Okay. <laughs> well, put it on your radar. But this, that, was, this was all made tentative just in the last day or so, yeah. so. And we'll confirm that by probably next weekend, Pastor? Uh, yeah, if not sooner, we can post it. Yeah. yeah, okay. Did I see hands? Is there something else? Yes, yeah, Sherry. Excuse me? Oh, don't, uh, that's June 29th. Anything else? Did I miss anyone else? Okay, we will conclude our service with the final hymn being number 553. We all are one in mission. Thank you. 552. Oh, 552. Five, five,
on if this mic is live during the singing because it goes into the pad and into people's homes. So I've just been lip syncing now ever since. <laughs> uh, she can tell me because nobody wants to hear my voice, but everybody wants the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to go with us all. Continue to receive the benediction. Thank you.